Hi, and welcome to the Cosmic Pulse, our Libra Ingress episode, which is our quarterly episode sponsored by the International Academy of Astrology. And I am so pleased today to have as our guest to talk to us about medical astrology is IAA alumni graduate, Dr. Anita Kolich. Welcome, Anita. Thank you so much for joining us and making time. Thank you for visit. having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is exciting. And like I was saying in our email, that I was so thrilled to learn that there was an MD practitioner who was also not only an astrologer, which is so such a huge, I think, win or support for the field of astrology, but also as a medical astrologer, as you are a guest on the School of Traditional Astrology. And I also just finished the practicum part two of that and you were one of the guest speakers in the first part so I'm wondering if you feel comfortable just sharing a little bit about yourself maybe your journey first as a medical doctor and then how you your journey into astrology how did you how did you, how did you discover or come to find IAA and then from there your journey into medical astrology so very good questions I um I knew that from when I was little, I wanted to be a doctor, but it was sort of, a, I went to art school. Oh. I didn't really have a lot of uh, role models in my family for, you know, professional women. So it, it it was kind of a leap of faith, really, at one point when I was, uh, let's see, I had graduated from college and I told my family, I want to go to medical school. And they said, oh, yeah, right. And so wow. I ended up and I, I went to art school, so I had to go back and do all my pre-med stuff. So they were a little bit skeptical, but, you know, supportive to some extent. And I went back and did a bunch of pre-med classes, which um, I loved. I actually, when I finished art school, I was a photography major and I worked wow. at Children's Hospital as my first job after graduating from Rhode Island School of Design. And I was taking pictures of um, I did a lot of photographs of children that had uh, deformities because they have a big pediatric clinic there, oh. plastic surgery clinic. And then I also photographed a lot of research experiments. And I kept thinking to myself, I really want to be on the other side of this lens, not taking the picture. I want to be doing the work. So that kind of made me, spurred me on into going into medical school. And I had to go back, as I said, and do all my pre-med stuff. So I did that. Um, and then I went to Columbia wow. and um, much to the man at the general studies office dismay, he told me, oh, you'll never get in. And when I got my acceptance to Columbia, <laughs> I walked into his office and said, look at this. Waved it in front of his face. That's and right. Said, Take that. I remember his name. His name was Frank and he was very stunned, but it was great. So anyway, I ended up going to medical school and Let's see. I was doing my residency um, in Portland. I moved to Portland. I had a child when I was in my last year of medical school. So wow. I moved with a baby as an intern. I had a six month old who's now 30. Um, and we moved to Portland, Oregon, very busy, had another baby um, in my second year of residency. And then um, my mother got sick and died and my marriage kind of fell apart and I got divorced. And so there was lots of upheaval, which is sort of interesting, if, you know, looking at the transits that were going on then. But in any case, um, and then I got really sick. I, I was a runner and I was training for the Boston Marathon. And all of a sudden my ankle was really swollen and I, I just couldn't run anymore. And I, I ended up with this autoimmune disease called sarcoidosis. And it just came upon me just like a lightning flash. And I was really sick. And no, because I was a medical doctor, I knew that the only, really the only treatment was prednisone or steroids. And oh. I didn't really like that as an option. So mm -hmm. I went to see a naturopath and she gave me the name of a, a um, medical astrologer named Paul Bergner, who you might know, he was the, at the time, he was the um, clinical program director at Rocky Mountain Center for Botanical Studies. 
and he was the editor of a journal called medical herbalism and he was practicing medical astrology oh so i called him and i had a um phone but you know they didn't have zoom in those days this was Uh in january or uh, probably early february of 2000 so it was a long time ago and so I, he, I said, you know, I, I want to talk to you about what's going on with me because something's oh. the matter. So I called oh. him and he, he looked at my chart and he did wow. this, this workup for me that was so amazing. I was completely blown away uh-huh. because the first thing he said to me was, so are you having some swelling? And this is over <laughs> the phone. Oh, he had no idea. I didn't tell him. I just said, I'm having some medical issues. Uh-huh. Can you look at my chart and help? To help me decide what to do. Uh-huh. He said, I think, are, are you having some problems with swelling in your legs? Incredible. And I was, I almost dropped the phone. <laughs> it was, it was amazing. So that kind of made me really take pause and say, there is, this is not a, this is not something out of the blue. This is an amazing science that's been, you know, studied for almost as long, if not longer, well, probably longer than Western medicine. And I need to listen here. So I think that consultation with Paul Bergner is kind of what made me realize that I wanted to do astrology at some point, but I was really busy then. I was going through a divorce. I was sick. I had two little kids and I was like a, a year out of my residency. So there was no way I could do it then. Right, right. And so life went on and like, I guess 14 years later, believe it or not, I'd I'd gotten remarried, had another baby and life had kind of gotten a little bit calmer for me. So I had some more free time and I was, I was working full time, but I had free, I had enough free time to be able to go start school. So, and that's when I, I actually remember one day calling Lee Lehman out of the blue, because I sort of looked up medical astrology online and I called her out of the blue and said, I would like to be your student. And you can imagine <laughs> how that was, how she, <laughs> she, I didn't hear back from her. Actually, I think I emailed her. Um, and now that I know Lee, she probably just totally rolled her eyes and went, oh my gosh, who is this person? But she and I are, you know, she's my my mentor. She's my 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 best teacher. And I just, I love being her friend and her student and, you know, working with her. So it's just sort of funny how it all turned out, but that's kind of what got me started on medical astrology to begin with. Um, that, that's an amazing story. And that moment over the phone, you know, in some fields would say that was the moment of like evidence for you that it wasn't just something that the person guessed out of the blue. I mean, how could it have been just so on the ball or, you know, on the first go. Exactly. The right spot and the same kind of symptom. I mean, what are the odds of, of, of that when they've never, you know, it's over the phone? Yeah. And, and he had no idea. I mean, I was very clear that I didn't tell, I didn't give him any information because I wanted to see if this was real. Uh, and yes. I was just, I mean, I was stunned. So, so yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, but that's really what got me started. I I have a few thoughts. First, that I think it's so amazing and admirable that you did not go the conventional route of pre-med, which is, you know, do your organic chemistry, your biology, you know, either do two years of undergrad um, science or finish a degree. Or in Canada, it's a master's or sometimes a PhD. Um, before, you know, they're admitted into medical school. But there is a university in in Ontario that doesn't require an undergraduate science and they accept any degree like yourself. It's just you need to take the uh, prerequisites for, you know, biology, anatomy, organic chemistry. And I'm wondering... I think that gives you a unique perspective coming from an arts background, being a photographer. Can you comment a little bit on that? Like when you, when you enrolled into your medical program, how many other classmates were there who, who shared that similar background as, as you? None really. And that's why they looked at my application. I mean, well, that's not true. I think there was one other older student because I was older by that point. I mean, all the other um 
classmates were, I was in my, uh, let's see, I was in my early, no, I was in my late twenties when I went to med school and most of the other students were younger than that. And there was, I think there was one or two other, in fact, there was a couple from Utah that were both Mormon and they were older and had done some other life stuff. Um, and that's, I can't remember. There's one other woman, I think, but for the most part, I mean, I, I actually talked to them about that. And they said to me that the reason they, they looked at my application was because I had this very different, um, yeah. route to get there and clearly had some life experience that, and I think that really in pretty much all health, um, areas makes a better or makes a more well-rounded practitioner because you have experience with kind of facets of life that you otherwise wouldn't have had and yeah. if you're not just thinking about cells and mathematical equations it's all about a person and you have some of that oh. person experience to draw on um and that's really i mean i always say now it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but I think internal medicine is, is uh 60% psychiatry. And, you know, that's, it's just a matter of really understanding how to ask the right questions to the right, you know, in the right way to get the right answer that'll lead you to a diagnosis. So, and I think astrology has a lot of this, so those same um, characteristics. You have to kind of get this gut feeling about a person. That's mm -hmm. why I really believe that you have to do this in person. I, I'm struggling a little bit with the whole Zoom thing. I mean, I, I haven't started practicing that. Well, that's not true. I have. I have some clients here that I see, but I do it in person. And that's really what I hope to do after I'm, I retire from medicine is to see people in person. And I think the, the community I live in, there's definitely a big enough um, draw so that I think I would be able to do that, um, when I retire. So, but I, I, I don't know how people do it on zoom is my point. I think there's, it's really, to me, something you've got to be in person. You've got to be in that person's space to understand and, sort of where they're coming from. And, and, and that's about being a medical astrologer, not yes, as yes, a medical. MD. Exactly. It, well, as a medical MD too. I mean, mm -hmm. we do with COVID, we did a lot of zoom. Mm -hmm. and now and meetings and that was it's it's great to see the other parts of the patient's life like their dog and their house and <laughs> you know all those things that sort of make up a person but by the same token it's really hard to get a sense of whether they're really ailing or not through zoom i think so i really prefer doing things in person i i think that's wonderful the the ailments that 60 percent psychiatry with internal medicine is that internal medicine is the area of the gut and if i understand no not only the gut but but um apparently is it true that the gut the bacteria in the gut is linked to our autoimmune system and then absolutely our emotions or our thoughts that plays into it so is that what you were referring to in terms of 60 percent psychiatry, psychiatry. Which, yeah mm, well not really i mean it's, so internal medicine is really just um and that was one of the questions on the outline is internal medicine is really the study of it's a diagnostic science of adults so you don't i don't see any children okay um i it's oh. a um assessment and diagnosis of adult um oh. patients and so it can be any system in the body really okay you basically take a constellation of symptoms a physical exam and um make an assessment in terms of how to work up what's going on with them and make a, a list of differential diagnoses and then find a diagnosis and then treat it so it's a um it's an investigative investigative science i suppose as opposed to family practice which i think is more about um sort of putting out fires um oh. when someone comes in like a walk-in clinic sort of i mean i'm not making any statements about family practice in general. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think that I am, I don't approve of that, but I do think that there's a, there's a role for internal medicine mm -hmm. and a role for family practice. And sometimes they, they don't necessarily cross. There's places where they don't cross as well. Um, in, in a rural setting, for instance, you need someone that knows about peds and mm -hmm. adult medicine an OBGYN and a little mm -hmm. bit of general surgery. And that's where a family practice doc really is, is, a, is important. 
but in a setting where there's, um, you know, subspecialists and enough other providers, I think there's a reason to um, be looking more towards uh, as an adult complicated patient, an internal medicine doctor, so. And and when you were a student at IAA and you were studying, uh, am I right to assume that when you contacted Lee at that time, she was part of the faculty of yes. the National Academy of Astrology? Yes, and was she it was. Your, for, was it your main intention to, because of your experience with, with Paul, or sorry, was it Peter? Paul, uh, yeah. Paul, that you wanted to, your motivation was medical astrology. Yeah, and I was wow. completely, I didn't know that you had to start from the beginning. I mean, I sort of did, I think, in my heart of hearts, but I I just wanted to jump to the chase, uh -huh, you know, and, uh -huh. and man, was I wrong, <laughs> because all of the foundational stuff is so critical. And, I, you know, I loved my classes that I had at IAA. I went through the whole program, and it took me a while because I could only really take one at a time. And there were some times of the year that were harder for me to go to school, yeah. but um, I finished it finally and it was exciting. And I, and I realized at the end how, you know, silly and sort of um, just basic. My idea was to just call Lee and say, okay, I want to be a medical astrologer because I went to medical school. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was part of the journey and, and like you specialize in internal medicine, that ne medical astrology is a specialty of astrology. So it, exactly. you know, it makes sense. There's parallels. And, and, but when you were a student at IAA, because you were motivated to, you know, to, to know medical astrology, did you find that you were you know, looking up significators of anatomy already, like in by, you know, maybe Nat 4 or chart synthesis? You know, I wasn't because all of it was so new to me that I really needed to study and learn all, everything. And I knew that the only way that I was really, I mean, it, it was clear to me from the beginning that the only way I was going to be any good as a medical astrologer is if I had a fairly good grasp of all the other Mm -hmm. branches of astrology because it all ties into that yeah. statement about internal medicine is 60 percent psychiatry you really need to know the person's motivation and mm. what they're about in order to understand where their their internal weaknesses are going to be and that's kind of what i see in medical astrology and how it connects with that idea is you know you really need to understand a person's motivations unconscious and conscious motivations mm -hmm. to really get a good sense of of what strengths they have and where there might be weaknesses. Um, and that's really, to me, where looking at a natal chart is critical and understanding that, and then really understanding the person. Yeah, and and so you have this unique perspective because you've got your training as an internal medicine practitioner and then medical astrology. Can you tell me any parallels that you have between the two more specifically i love at the beginning how you 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 reference you know astrology as a science in itself and although some skeptics might argue that it's it's not a science and one thing that has come across through you know reading um memoirs of um doctors who have who've authored books they've they've said that you know medicine is not just you know an application of symptoms and diagnoses that sometimes there's a you know it doesn't always fit the the cases that mm -hmm. that they're supposed to and that there's an aspect of intuition as a medical doctor can you talk to that uh using your, your perspective of both in your family in your Inter your practice of internal medicine as well as you know medical astrology or astrology um i can't uh yes to some extent i think where i use it right now um is in understanding um complicated patient complaints where i'm mm. not really sure from a western medicine standpoint after i've done the workup that i think is appropriate what is going on with the patient okay. and that's where i really you know, I'll, I always ask my patients where, where were you born? Cause I want to <laughs> have that data. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, you know, if there is something that's going on that I'm really struggling with understanding, I will say to them, you know, I do have this other um, practice that I use to help me as a tool in medicine. Would you be willing to give me your birth time? And usually they'll ask, they'll say, well, what are you going to do yeah, with it? And uh -huh. I'll explain to them, you know, this is a way for me to understand what's going on with you better and to understand the timing of what, of this illness that you have. Mm -hmm. And they, people are pretty open to it if I explain it in that way. And, um, and that's kind of how I use that, um, right now, how I'm using the, my medical astrology knowledge that. in terms of understanding sort of complicated things, or if a patient is in the hospital and things aren't fitting together the way we expect them, then I'll, I'll take a look at a chart that's not timed, which isn't as, as easy. You, I, I really find that it's really important to have um, the birth time to understand uh -huh. natal weaknesses and strengths, but the uh -huh. decumbature charts are incredibly helpful too and can really shed lots of light on, on, you know, what could be coming for the patient or how quickly they're going to get better. And so that's something that um, has been really helpful and the way that I use it right now. I, I didn't, um, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking of this question um, off, off the cuff. Do you have any standout stories that you, you can think of where it, you know, was a successful outcome or the patient kind of realized that they were helped because of this added modality that isn't, they weren't, you know, typically expecting? Mm -hmm. um, well, I can think of one, a patient that was very, very worried that she had some kind of malignancy in her bowels. Mm -hmm. And um, she actually was, um, someone who came over and I did a consultation with and I she'd had a lot of different tests and nothing had really come up but she was really worried about this and looking at the charts and looking at the decumbiture I was able to kind of reassure her that I really didn't think this was anything that was going to end up causing um long-term problems for mm -hmm. her but that a dietary change was probably something that was important and she ended up taking that and going, you know, a little further, because I don't do, you know, naturopathic, mm -hmm. um, I don't do any naturopathic stuff. I make some tinctures, but for the most part, I leave that tr naturopathic treatment to naturopaths, mm -hmm. because I really think, you know, I, what I want to use is my diagnostic skills uh -huh. and my ability to, you know, understand what's going on with the patient. And then send them to the right professional because naturopaths are incredibly, I mean, they have their own long, incredible training. So uh -huh. I sent her to a naturopath and it turned out that she did have some really, really terrible um, digestive issues. And that was really the problem. And, but I was able to reassure her that this was not a malignancy. This was not going to kill her. This was okay. And really what she needed was some dietary, a dietary change that was important. And so that was one that I can think of. Um, Thank you. That's, that's great. And yeah. That, and I, I like using other natural, other uh -huh. alternative medicine practitioners. I mean, I'll definitely send, send folks to massage or acupuncture, uh -huh. or uh -huh. if that's what it looks like they need. According than, to the chart. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Rather than me trying to, cause I can't do all those things. Yeah. Uh -huh. I can give them guidance about what, what may be going on what may be coming in the future and what might help them. But I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to stir up um, naturopathic tinctures in my kitchen. That's just yeah, not, yeah, yeah. not in my scope. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I, I don't know. I hope this is not, I mean, I think this is a reasonable question, but had you not had that other modality to look at a medical astrology chart? Like, so say if you could role play and put yourself in the shoes of another internal medicine practitioner, what would have been the tools available for that patient or their symptoms? Would it have been medication or drugs like pharmaceuticals? Well, that's generally what, what people lean to, you know, mm -hmm. if patients these days, most people, and I hate to generalize, but it's pretty true. They expect to get something when they go to the doctor, like a pill or a test or some tangible mm -hmm. thing that's going to help them. And 
that's really a lot of times what people look for. And I find with using medical astrology as a help with my diagnosis, I can, oh, I just had a recent one, actually. This is a good example. Um, she's, it was a patient that came in and was having terrible problems with depression and all kinds of fatigue and just, you know, she thought she had Lyme disease and she thought she had all kinds of, you know, medical issues related to this horrible depression and insomnia and fatigue and, and um, joint pain. And, I, you know, looking at her chart and talking to her and doing a few tests, it, it was really about what's going on with the Saturn and Mars transits in her chart. And I said, you're going to feel better by next spring. This is not something that I can give you a pill to fix. I had a little, a little bit of serotonin would help. Uh -huh. And, you know, you can do either St. John's Ward or I can give you Lexapro. But for the most part, this is not a medical issue that is a terrible thing that's going to hurt you. This is something that has to do with what's going on with the stars and the energy in your chart. And that was really helpful to her. Um, and I forgot your question. No, I that, that was I think that was I, I mean, I got I think I forgot it, too, because I'm just so you know, in, in, in enthralled by the fascination that, that you feel comfortable saying that to your patients and that they're receptive. And then it helps them because I'm, I'm not against pharmaceuticals or, uh, you know, um, standard medicine. I think there's been a lot of gains and people live longer, um, you know, and with vaccines and all that kind of stuff. But I think some they, people don't, though. That's the thing. I mean, yes. some people can't take vaccines. And that's another yeah. thing I really can tell. But I mean, I, I really I really will embrace that in someone if they don't want to go there. And, and a lot and, of practitioners won't do that. Or they can't because they can't. Because right. what, what other tool do they have? And that leads me to a, a much larger uh theme about astrology and in its mainstream society in say public education and you know in in medical schools i mean do your colleagues know about your abilities as an astrologer how are they what is their attitude to astrology it, you know it's really interesting some of them just think the whole thing is it's sort of ridiculous and some of them are really okay with it and so i have to be careful about who i talk to about it and and how do you sense like when you're comfortable to you know disclose because i can i understand where you're coming from i i've had that same you know i feel like i've had to be one in hiding until about two years ago and for me usually i have to know the person long enough and you know and I know these are generalizations but you know usually if people who are usually artists or they do yoga or they're into alternative care um they still see their doctor or they're you know interested in um some of them are interested or or not interested but they're open to the idea that there is extraterrestrial life or there's, you know, energies and, you know, remote viewing and, and that kind of thing. Well, I think you can really get a sense when you're, when you're talking to somebody and, you know, I have a panel of patients that I take care of and I, I can kind of tell which oh. ones are open. And I think you're right. You know, so anyone who's gone to an acupuncture doctor for a oh. long time about anything or goes uh -huh. to a naturopath as a, or a chiropractor even, you know uh -huh. that they're probably going to be open to this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But it's interesting when I have a patient who I never would have guessed would be interested and they really are. And that's pretty cool. Um, and that has happened a couple of times when, um, when I've had, like I was, I did a little, I'm working a little bit on a, a diabetes study on, um, you know, Jupiterian issues in the chart, in the natal chart, and how that transits going forward can predict or um, help define, you know, when they, when and if they may end up having problems with diabetes. And so I've, I have a fair number of medical colleagues with diabetes that I've talked to about it. And oddly enough, I think people that have sort of chronic diseases like that are more open to mm understanding if there's some other way to help them yeah. because they have to live with this disease. And, so, and, 
it's that's that's another kind of it's a generalization but it's also kind of a place that i'm looking at um studying a little bit more because i really think that they those folks sort of want to know like why did i get this bad card mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what and is I, it that yeah what is it that put me at risk rather than my brother or whatever and i think that's fantastic because i think it also speaks to sometimes the limitations that modern medicine has as well right. and yeah and it might also give them some peace of mind that's what astrology did for me it, it helped me mm -hmm. and i think it helps a lot of people accept or come to terms to a certain extent of like you just said like why did i get this lot or why right. did this set of crises you know the the things that you had to just uh described earlier it's like as you were saying them i'm like pluto uranus neptune you know like just basically overhaul of of you know all these circumstances of life changing and i was just saying to somebody the other the earlier that i had this um, high school french teacher and he would sometimes you know it'd be in completely inappropriate now but kind of knock another teacher and you know that there were these things that come in three because it was like this one disaster and then another disaster and then another disaster so it's that that saying what like when it rains it really rains right like it when it rains it pours right um, and and i think those difficult transits can give some kind of explanation and that you know later on that when one person when the person looks back they they can see that there was some silver lining or positive outcome that resulted of of it meanwhile well, it's it's things that we don't want happen to us well it, it also wasn't their fault yeah yeah it yeah. wasn't something that they did it was mm -hmm. like it was an external force that they really didn't have a lot of control over and i think for this patient that has had the has the depression who's doing better by the way because i think what she and i talked about is that now she understands that what's going on with her partner and what's going on in her own head about understanding who she is isn't so much about her having some me me mental or mm. medical problem it's about what's going on in in the sky and she happens to be very into astrology so it's not actually a very fair example but i think what we talked about the last time i saw her was that she, because she knows that there's going to be a length of time where this is going to be a problem she can use that to her benefit to mm. under you know to like restructure what she needs to restructure instead of fighting against it or saying why is this happening to me yeah so it's that's the sort of thing that can be really helpful for people and you're listening to the cosmic pulse from the international academy of astrology we'll be right back Hi, I'm Ed Perone. I'm the video archivist for the International Academy of Astrology, and I'd like to invite you to try our new video streaming service, Astrology Flix. Astrology Flix is like Netflix for astrology. Subscribers receive full access to a curated library of astrology lectures, workshops, mini courses, and other material from some of the leading astrological minds of our time. Watch videos from Robert Hand, Rick Levine, Robert Schmidt, Samuel F. Reynolds, Donna Van Toen, Joni Petrie, Nicholas Campion, and many, many more. We're adding new videos twice a month, so you'll always find something new and stimulating. Check us out at astrologyflix.com. And that sounds almost, I'm not sure if I'm, if this is a, a correct uh, reference, but almost evolutionary in the sense that it shifts her energy and focus. Right. So like you said, ruminating or focusing on this one thought or feeling about like the problem to, okay, let's explore it or consider it from this other point of view and work with it or respond to that energy in that evolutionary or psychological way 
Exactly. It sort of goes back to, you know, basic natal astrology where, you know, everyone's going to have some placement in their chart that's not going to be great. But you can also look at it on the other with another angle is that this is a place where you have opportunity to work on stuff mm -hmm. because it's not because it isn't a great placement of something. And I think that knowledge is very powerful for people when they have when they're having some sort of medical problem. And and this other question, because I I had shared with you that I have a family member who's also um, in internal medicine, and I had shared that I had just finished, you know, stamp two, and her, you know, she's she's very um, she's got Pluto on her son, and um, very Virgo Virgoian, and and she said, so is everything faded? Mm -hmm. like in terms of and I was like whoa that was like I didn't really expect that right away it's so a good some, question yeah in terms of like is it faded for each individual if you look at the you know sixth eighth first model you know is it faded what what do you think well I I don't think it's faded I think there's a lot of it that's in our control and ha but having that knowledge knowledge is power in my opinion mm -hmm. and that you know no, understanding where those um health and psychological weaknesses are is absolutely critical to making the best of whatever you've got and that's why I think it's really important um to to really have that background be able to move forward and say this isn't this isn't a bad thing. This is actually a good thing. I can use this to my benefit. So that's sort of how I try and approach it with patients. Yeah. And I, I, I like that because then it's like almost akin to, you know, you, you can get genetic testing or screening and it can tell you a predisposition, but it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. You can, you can have lifestyle factors like diet exercise and and that kind of thing to try to mitigate it to strengthen that vitality or and that's exactly. not even like using astrology that's just you know if you if if, if a person yeah knows it's using how, common uh, sense <laughs> yeah like has like they know there's a hereditary feature of of you know like let's say diabetes then that person would you know, if they wanted to kind of do that, like implement uh, preventative measures, maybe like monitor sugar cravings, you know, maybe like don't have all that candy and, and processed sugar kind of thing. Exactly. Or start exercising. With medical astrology, and, and if there was, because you want to see people in person, and right now you're practicing internal medicine, what would you recommend to somebody who is looking for a medical astrologer? I guess the question is like, what do you think a medical astrologer should have? Like, do you think knowing astrology and then learning medical astrology is enough? Or do you think that they should have some kind of medical background, either, you know, if they're a nurse or, um, you know, a, a doctor or um, a naturopath or homeopath or Ayurvedic or traditional Chinese medicine or acupuncture or um, herbalism. What, what What's your thought? What are your thoughts on that for people who are looking for an a medical astrologer? It's a tricky question. And I, I know that my answer isn't going to be really um, the medical astrologer um, has you know, really enough sense to rule out anything medical going on before they, you know, embark on a big diagnostic workup with a patient because you really don't want to miss some terrible thing with a patient. And a lot of people don't, you know, they're kind of like ostriches with their head in the sand about their health and they really don't want to admit that they've got something bad wrong with them. And that's where you really need to have a full workup by a medical doctor before I think you ask an astrology um, practitioner, a medical astrologer practitioner to to get involved because I, 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 there are, you know, there, there's, there's good practitioners out there and there's ones that are going to get a workup. And I, I just, oh no, really? But I, if, I think what I caught was you prefaced it with, it may not be a popular uh, piece of advice, but you think that a person should go 
get a proper medical, like you said, workup or do- like assessment by uh, an MD. Or, or a DO or, you know, a naturopath is, if, the, if they're a good naturopath would be okay or Chinese mm-hmm. medicine, any of those, those are okay. Um, but I think that needs to happen before they're going to, um, before they should seek the advice of a medical astrologer. And I think that's one reason why patients appreciate talking to me about it because they know that I've already ruled out all the stuff that, you know, I've looked at yes. the worst case scenario and we've talked about that and ruled it out. And so now we're moving towards um, something that is a longer term fix um, that has to do really more with with natal weaknesses and strengths and um, transits um, because I, I just would hate to have someone um, miss a, a cancer or something that was really treatable. I think that's a fantastic piece of advice. Uh, it makes sense to me. Yeah. And I, I think I can totally see uh, your retirement plans that you would be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> like I can, I mean, I'm probably, you're already very busy, uh, in your medical practice, but you will probably be just as busy, uh, as a medical astrologer because of, um, you know, your, your experience, your training and experience, um, as a medical specialist and then as well as a medical astrologer. So and the other part to it that, you know, I, I think is important is that my colleagues as doctors that I may um, lean on for these workups are going to trust that I have the judgment to say, these are the labs that you need to ask your doctor for. This mm-hmm. is why. And that way they're going with a, um, with a, with a request to their provider that is appropriate and has medical, um, some medical decision making built in. Yeah. And and can you also talk about a little bit in terms of the the approach of medicine say in the times of William Lilly in the 1500s uh compared to today? I mean, it I understand that it used to be um up to a certain point in time, maybe the 1700s, 1800s. I it's not fresh off the top of my head that a doctor couldn't practice medicine unless they were an astrologer. Yeah, I know. And I think that's that was really back. I mean, we didn't have we had this huge development of um of information with Lou and Hook uh, who uh, designed the first microscope and looked at little cellular organisms and and things research and development that had to occur before we really understood how the body worked. But I really I think that the the astrological medical doctors really if I lived back then I would have gone to them way faster than a barber surgeon who really just like, <laughs> things off. Oh my I mean, god, a barber surgeon. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know they didn't really know how to do anything except you know. Yeah, things off. Out. Yeah, exactly. And so it was not a good time to be sick back then, but I think that I think back in Hippocrates days, they really had a better chance of understanding that 60% of psychiatry. And and those were the pe- people that got better is the ones that really had sort of some psychosocial issues that needed fixing that were causing their um medical problems. Those were the ones that Hippocrates was really able to help stood the importance of um, psychology and the whole social environment, familial social environment and economic factors that went into a person's illness. Um, so, yeah, I, I've, it's really remarkable to me how astrology just fell out of, out of the curriculum. And it's really too bad because I think we'd, we'd all be better off if it hadn't gone away. Um, I I know this is not your realm of, of expertise to, to respond to or answer, but it just came another thought about, you know, you know, the, the medical schools, the universities, they likely or are not, uh, you know, incorporating astrology, but I'm, I'm curious about, you know, the training programs of, you know, homeopathy or naturopathy, uh, whether they, that would, if that would be uh, a course or a part of the, the training or maybe an elective. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, I know Ayurvedic, that's 
more cultural because um, you know, there's Yoitish astrology and Ayurvedic, like similar, that system, similar to the way that the, you know, Chinese uh, four pillars is, is connected to the traditional Chinese medicine system. Um, but it'd be interesting uh, to see, you know, where astrology might be. In I fit in there. I agree with you. Yeah. I think that would be really fantastic. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's part of their, if it's an elective in, in a naturopathic yeah. curriculum. And um, I would think like an herbalist training part, because I think there's a history with like plants and, and planetary significations mm -hmm. um, that's out there. Yeah. it's And the little bit I've dabbled in making tinctures, it's uh -huh. really, really compelling to elect the right time to make a tincture uh -huh. based on what you're using it for and um, the significators of the, of the um, plant that you're using. And, and that, I, I don't, I don't think those, I don't think you can basically make tinctures without electing astrological, uh -huh. astrologically the right date and time for it. Interesting. Um, I didn't, I didn't know that about tincture making. Oh yeah. I mean, That's I, funny. yeah, I think it's, it's really, really incredibly powerful. I mean, I made a mean nettle tincture for, for Lee and Maggie that they still talk about, but, and it just <laughs> happened to be the right election. <laughs> and, and so Lee is a, you know, uses the medieval, like traditional astrology. And when you were going through IAA, did, did, were you exposed to like the sixth house in a different like lens of, of uh, interpretation? Like when you were learning about sixth house, was it always the house of disease or have you come across other modern, you know, significations of like, you know, health routine and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Was I, you know, it depended on what class I was taking. I mean, yeah. What, what do you think day about day that? routine and like your, you know, the workplace is, was it, yeah. what do I think about it having two different significations? Yeah. Yeah. Just well, when I think you it makes sense. I mean, I think that the medical astrology is really, as we said earlier, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, one of the components of astrology. It's mm -hmm. a specialty. And so it's a way of looking at um, what's going on there that's not the same as as natal astrology or horraries well horary is part of it but or mundane or any of the other specialties so I, I think it's important that you that you remember all of the significations of those houses when you're looking at a medical chart so I mean obviously the thing that's the most important is our medical significations but they also I have other meaning I, I guess this is where I'm going next is a bit of playing the devil's advocate or taking more of like a, what I'd like to think is more my, maybe critical inquiry in, in that if, you know, we have our current set planets and significators and, you know, maybe more so now with um, dwarf planets and, and we have the asteroids and now we know so much more about the sky. Like there's so much more out there that, mm -hmm. and then at the same time we have, you know, cell models and we have, um, you know, sub atomic particle physics and we have all these, like, you know, our modern science has uh, dissected and separated and gone into the microscopic I've wondered, you know, like what, what would the, you know, DNA letters like R or R M R N A like, or um, osmosis and all those things that we know that happen in the body biologically, where would they fit in the chart? Have you, have you ever wondered about that? I have wondered, but I, so I, I don't think it's necessary to use all of that um, intellectual um, energy to try and fit little bits of microscopic detail that's been discovered and right. and all of these things into the chart because really we have a, an incredibly rich amount of information just using the basics and I, so you know people can do that if they want but it's not something that I need and I don't I don't intend to go there with that right um, so. that's, that's very helpful uh, a, a great response to, you know, a skeptical mind that, you know, because there's always, because if you do that, 
yeah, you, you just, you can get so caught up in those sort of infinitesimally small details that you mm -hmm. just lose sight of the big picture. Mm -hmm. And, and I, we're veering a little bit, we're kind of, uh, I'm, I'm leading you on to uh, kind of a zooming out a little bit from medical astrology um, to, I guess, some themes about astrology and that we've touched upon is that the skepticism of astrology. And I think that you're a medical doctor and an astrologer and a medical astrologer is, is such a, a win for the field of astrology. And I'm wondering how many others do you know of? I mean, I know in my uh, stamp two class, there were two, there are two doctors. Um, so I right now know of three. Do you, do you know of yeah. any? Like how many other how others do you know of who who have a similar background as you? You know, it's interesting because I think I know the two that were in your class because yeah. they introduced themselves. And I think that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that's actually a medical professional that's practicing as a medical astrologer. Um, and I, I think it's so I think it's so interesting because and I, I said this in our email that and of course, this is very subjective. It's just, um, you know, my own experience. So it's just an anecdotal, you know, very non-objective description that, you know, of the professions, when I first started a formal astrological studies, and I, I went to the ISAR conference in Chicago in 2009, and I met people who were astrologers and they were they were nurses I met one person who had retired from public school education and that's Carol Tebbs at, at Kepler mm -hmm. and she had her advice was you have to keep those separate you know like it's just they cannot cross over and but then at as a student at IAA, you know, I, there was, there was, you know, some, there was a lawyer, some other educators, there were um, people in finance or business, uh, maybe, but no, no um, medical doctors. And it, and I know, like, you were the first one, you know, when I, when I saw your video, and that was just probably recently, so you had graduated in 2018, and I was thrilled because I did not know any other person. <laughs> There's not very many of us. Well, I think part of it is that, you know, medical training is really long and arduous, and then you get to practicing, and it's very tiring, because mm. especially, I mean, what I do is I'm, I'm really, I'm very good at compartmentalizing, and that's partly because of my chart, but um, I, I don't take home what's going on. And then that's not to say that I don't care about my patients, because I think, I probably am. I, I I can't go on vacation without taking my my computer with me and making sure everybody's all right. I, I cannot relinquish care of my patients to any of my partners. And I trust my partners implicitly, but I still want to have my hands in everything, even when I'm on vacation. And there's not a lot of people that do that. Most people just check out and say, I'll see you in two weeks. And I cannot do that. So, but I also don't, I, I, I find time to, um, I, I've got to have time to rest my brain. And when I come home, it's time for me to do that. And, you know, I, the intellectual stimulation of, of doing medical astrology, to me, it's like a whole nother part of my brain function. So it's not tiring. It's like I can come home from a long day of working in the clinic and come home and look at charts. And it, I don't feel, I feel like that part of my brain is excited and not tired. So there's, there's, just, I just, I guess I'm just a little bit weird. I don't know. I don't think so. And I think that you described the trait of compartmentalization. I think that is a survival mechanism that um, medical doctors need to have. Like I yes. have a few people in my family who are medical doctors and, you know, I have one family member who is very much in the fine, you know, arts and, and not in medicine. And you you need that otherwise your job will never end you will just right. burn out so you you have to have that distance and that compartmentalization there there needs to be a self preservation so i i think that's that isn't something that you know needs to be explained or you know i think that's that's necessary so and i think it's a it's a trait that's very common um 
in in medical doctors because they they have to right otherwise right. you'll you'll never you know like you would never be able to shut down or enjoy or and and you need that it's like, right or you'd feel like you missed something i mean i see so many people just thinking well, what if i had done this what if i'd done that and you just have to move forward um and and trust that you're making the right judgments about things and i i guess i I'm willing to say that I made a mistake if I did and rectify that and listen to my patients. I mean, that's really the key. Yeah. And I think it's the key to everything is listening to your patients, no matter whether it's an astrological consultation or a medical consultation. You can get everything you need if you A, know how to listen and B, know how to ask the right questions. Yeah. And those things go hand in hand. And I think that ties back to your story about going into you know design and arts because there's a sensitivity to that mm -hmm. there's like mm -hmm. a, a a skill that like listening is a part of observation so there's a openness or a receptivity to something outside of yourself whether that right. is you know the world around you taking f photographs or capturing it through um life drawing and then being you know a medical practitioner because if you lose that human sensitivity then all you're left with is like you know a rational ai mm -hmm. you know? exactly that, that's what makes us what we we say makes us different than a machine is that feeling and sensitivity and emotion i was listening to chris brennan um, astrological podcast recently where he was talking about chat GBT and how you could teach the computer how to do an astrological he had an example of um, uh, uh, the chat GBT doing a um, consultation on a placement and it was really imp impressive how you could how the the computer could actually learn how to do all that but i don't think that they could i don't think chat G, gpt could do it for medical astrology i really don't because you really need you need to have this other sort of um i don't know how to say it like emotional finesse or something there's like this piece to it that's not going to ever be computerized and that that's um, great like I, I guess it's we could say maybe compassion or empathy or yeah yeah kindness. well thank you so much for your time and allowing me to you know pull out all these like ask all these questions um it it oh, like welcome. it was really exciting for me too i mean i love being able to think about this and actually articulate it with someone because it's not often that people really want to know about this so i really appreciate it's it like I said, it's it's your rarity, like like we've just said that we know of three right now. <laughs> and, and 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 it's it's not to discredit any anyone else, but I mean we have, like we said earlier, more people open um from you know the alternative health practitioners, um, you know, herbalists, naturopaths, homeopaths. Um, and I think it's wonderful that those patients were open and benefited from them and i would hope that at some point they feel comfortable sharing that because that will open other people's minds or or at least open them to curiosity mm -hmm. and, and considering that there might be something to this right right you know what i would love to see in the future is clinics where there's a medical doctor, a naturopath, an acupuncturist, someone who does medical astrology, and they all work together to take care of people. And I mean, that's really, I, I would love to work in a clinic with uh, other alternative practitioners and be able I, to provide, you know, my part of the patient's sort of holistic care. That's sort of, that would be my, the ultimate retirement right there. I think That's you've got medical. something. I mean, I think you should jump on this because somebody listening to this is going to hop on it. <laughs> because I that's like and, and that actually you've kind of um, answered one of the other questions is like, where do you see the field of medical astrology heading? And you've basically answered you've tied that with the field of healthcare. 
Yeah, and I think it could be it could be a huge benefit, and it could. I mean, part of our healthcare challenge in this country is that it's so expensive because people come in over and over and over again for these things that really could be handled in that kind of clinic. And I, I don't know. I that's really that's where I see it going, and I think it would be so great if that could happen. And I just hope I still have the energy to do that in five years when I retire. I think I will. I, I'm kind of a boundless, I have boundless energy and I sleep really well. So I go 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour all day, and then I crash. But, and I think that is a beautiful example of the yin yang and that, that, that wholeness of, of, you know, both polarities because Eastern, Eastern medicine often conflicts with western medicine like western mm -hmm. being you know you go to your hospital or your family doctor like those medications or pharmaceuticals prescribed or you know just giving an example that um for a swelling of a joint uh first aid treatment is like ice the joint like ice mm -hmm. ice to reduce the swelling whereas in um traditional chinese medicine that's that heat and you don't want to treat the heat with cold right away you want to let the body kind of flow or flush it out so right. they're very um you know opposing approaches so at some point a patient has to, may have to kind of pick which one am i going to go with because oh, they're so complementary that's the thing they're really not mutually exclusive and i and that's what i try and explain and and encourage my patients to embrace because they really really complement each other you just have to have that mindset and I think you have to find the right practitioner. Yeah, yeah. So, you have to have you have to trust somebody. So I think that your where your the the patients who who have you are very lucky. Well, I, I like to think so. <laughs> and I, with that, I know that this is the end of you know uh, a workday for you. So. I would love to uh, connect again in the future, but I want to um, respect your your downtime and thank you on behalf of the International Academy for um, coming and being a part of our quarterly uh, Cardinal Ing Ingress podcast. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your inviting me and I'd love to come again. Just let me know. Yes. I can fit you in somewhere. I promise. Wonderful. And, you know, we're just so pleased that you chose the International Academy of Astrology um, and are part of our, you know, I think we have about over 50 alumni now. That's great. Yeah, that's great. So... It's a wonderful school. I, I've recommended it to lots of people that have asked me. Oh, Thank you. And I'm, I, I am a proud graduate. And like you said, um, the commitment and the time that it takes and that you did it working full time is, is, um, you know, something to be admired and respected. Well, it, it's doable. It's definitely doable for anyone out there that's thinking about it. And it's so incredibly exciting the whole way. Yes. I never, ever looked back. Yeah, same thing. Same thing with me. It just, I think it was one of those pivotal experiences that just would never dream of not doing, you know, so glad that I did it. And the, you know, Ina, the, st the founder, um, and Sam Reynolds is the, the president. I, I joined the board. I think this is my um, first, the end of my first year. So, you know, it's a, it's a dedicated bunch and the instructors as you, you know, experienced yeah. um, really are devoted to quality astrological education. And, and maybe when, maybe when you have time, you'll also be, you'll take on more um, instructional, you know, share your wisdom from the unique perspective that you have. Yeah, I would love to. I think uh, a seminar of some kind is kind of, and chart cases. I mean, I've been sort of amassing some PowerPoints of all the cases that are interesting. So, yeah. And the, um, the other thing that I know we're wrapping up, but when you were talking about diabetes, I was thinking, you know, there's type one, which is hereditary, if I'm correct. Yes. And well, then type two, which is then can be developed due to lifestyle or diet. Is that right? 
Well, it's some, it's some type of that. A virus of some kind that attacks the pancreas and oh. you know, the, the, the proclivity to, to having that happen may be genetic, but the actual, you know, person who gets attacked by the virus isn't necessarily genetic. So that's a little bit more complicated question, but mm -hmm. type two diabetes is really a matter of, uh, you know, sort of, um, lifestyle choices and is clearly something that can be, um, there can, there's a lot of places where uh, we can make some inroads in terms of, you know, people that are at risk and making sure that they don't go down that road or that they're aware that they have the potential to, we can help them not go there. If we get them early enough. I think this is leading into another, another whole, you know, at least an hour to pick your brains about that study. So I'm, we're going to leave listeners just um, wait, wanting more and waiting for <laughs> your, um, you know, when and how you decide to, to share that work. It sounds like um, maybe even a book at some point. Oh, my goodness. You're you're getting way ahead of me. <laughs> You're going to, you're going to help me with that. If we're oh, I would love to. <laughs> I've considered actually, I was kind of exploring, um, medical transcriptionist, but that, that requires, you know, a bit more training. I I've been, I've, I've, um, been toying with tradition, like read, like additional training, uh, as, a alternative healthcare pr practitioner, um, I mean, I've enjoyed the benefits of acupuncture, but I know the uh, amount of time and depth. Like my acupuncturist um, studied basically in secret in Japan um, because, and I'm not sure if that's the, it, the same um, kind of expectation, but at that time, and I'm talking about like in the 90s, uh, if you study with a master, you're not supposed to go study with other masters. But mm -hmm. this, my, my, um, my acupuncturist, like studied with multiple ones in secret and, and just sent all this moxie back, back home. So he's got wow. like a lifetime supply of like high quality moxie. Um, and, you know, I, I have, um, you know, Cantonese heritage. And I've had both the Japanese acupuncture as well as the Chinese. And I just, I, I'm sorry, but I just love the Japanese acupuncture experience. Um, but I just think that's too ambitious for me. So I'm exploring some other um, avenues, maybe aromatherapy. I was contemplating herbalism, but I think that might also be more in like long-term in-depth study. Oh, it's, it's an incredibly deep study. Yes. It really is. Yeah. yeah. I, I have so much um, respect for, for herbalists and naturopaths yes. and just yes. people that really know about that. And it's, it's a whole skill set, I think. Yeah. That's it's definitely not where I'm going at all. And I, <laughs> I, I really will rely on them for that. And, and it's, I don't know if you're interested in, um, or maybe, I mean, I, you, you probably already connect with her, but Nikki Allison in Australia. I'm oh thinking... yeah. Nikki and I, Nikki and I work together. She's yeah. great. I send her Valerian all the time. Oh, I, I'm thinking like the <laughs> two of you, but then you're on, different continents i'm like how could the two of you form that clinic that you're or part of that clinic you know that you were talking about that would be so cool i'm, I'm happy i could be your secretary your like receptionist oh no he, you would help us i'm sure in, in other ways but um well listen this has been great Thank you so much dr anita Kolich. and uh this is jen ingress um, wrapping up the Cosmic Paul, Cosmic Paul's podcast. And our next episode will be at the Capricorn Ingress. Until then, take care, everyone. You've been listening to the Cosmic Pulse from the International Academy of Astrology. New episodes are released at the solstices and equinoxes. Find us wherever you get your podcasts, as well as at astrologyflix.com. See you next time. Hello, I'm Ina Stanley. I'm the founder of the International Academy of Astrology, and I'd like to thank you for listening to our podcast, The Cosmic Pulse. 
If you'd like to find out more about our certification program in astrology or all of our other activities, please visit our website at astrocollege.org.